not a con. Because, okay, this makes me happy in ways you guys have no idea. Because I just literally spent the last hour writing the slides for this talk. I knew what I was talking about, but I hadn't had a chance, and uh, I'm on three hours of sleep. And the room seems to be moving, but I am not. And it's not due to alcohol. Uh, okay. No, no, it's called sleep. No sleep. Sleep is my enemy at this point. Or my friend. I can't keep him straight. <sighs> this year, were either of you at my talk last year? Excellent. You guys don't remember the horrible fiasco it was. Um, the talk had the horrible problem of not having enough direction. So this year, I'm going to talk about how an amateur radio repeater works. How many people sitting in this room, all four of us, are hams? Do you guys already know how a repeater works? Okay. Wow. Have, have, you've built them. You know how to use them. Have you built one, sir? Okay. I'm going to go into the details of all the crap necessary to make one actually operate. This means I will bore you out of your mind. I do apologize. I was expecting a whole lot more non-hams in the audience, but I have the red eye session. You know, I would be amused by this, but you don't have to. I try to make my... Right. I try not to inflict my brand of insanity on those who do not wish to have it inflicted upon them. Okay, so I'm going to do my talk exactly as is. You, sir, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you to sleep. Look at it this way, you can catch up on the sleep you've missed the rest of the weekend. Okay. okay yes, Excellent. The, the audience is quickly shifting away from everybody knows what I'm talking about, so why am I talking about it? Okay, amateur radio. If you've never heard of it, this is the 30 second variant of describing it. It's a service licensed by the FCC from the FCC. These slides have never been edited. It took me an hour to write them, it should take me an hour to go through them, right? Okay. Uh, service from the FCC a interesting variation in services because this is one of the strange ones that got put in a long time ago for various lobbying reasons because the airwaves were being commercialized and there was a question where do we put the people who want to experiment and the amateur radio service was born it is non-commercial by FCC regulations I cannot accept money for playing with radios this is a great bonus in my mind because it's one of the many things I do which I can't get paid to do. Thus, it's a hobby. This is how you tell the difference between hobby and work. One of them you get paid for, one of them you don't. Um, hmm? This is true. Truer than I thought. Um, amateur radio is really a wonderful licensing scheme which boils down to uh, Please do not be an idiot with your radio. There are some details they put in there. They have a provision against music, which is mostly there for hysterical or historical reasons. They didn't want hams competing with commercial radio stations and thus public broadcasting and all. Boring. I don't care. The other thing is, the neat trick is, hams can take any piece of hardware, paperclip, bubblegum, duct tape glued together. If it generates RF, they can look at it, grab their test gear, say, yes, it meets spec, I'm putting it on the air. They can use anything they want. If they end up with the radio that's built out of bailing wire and bubble gum, literally, they can certify it and they can put it on the air. This is exceedingly useful, as I will be getting to shortly. Okay, radios. Sir, hold up a radio, please because I don't feel like fishing the one out of my pocket. These things are called HTs. That stands for Handy Talkie. 
no, I am not making this up. That's really what Motorola has written on the back of them. Handy talkie. Blew my mind the first time I saw it. Um, they're common now. Everyone's got one. Really, everyone has an HT. By the way, um, interesting aside, if you actually own a Nextel cell phone, it's not a cell phone. It's a land mobile radio that happens to have a phone interface. Sorry. Seriously, it's licensed under land mobile radio service as opposed to the cell phone service. Yes. But that's an entirely different stuff and goes way beyond the depth of what I'm trying to cover today because that boils down to where I'm still trying to figure it out as opposed to what I like to give talks on, which is stuff I figured out. This makes me look a lot smarter than I am. Uh, okay, problem with HTs, they are very limited power. Most powerful HT I've ever seen is 7 watts. And I don't want to put that next to my head because I'd like to be able to see in 30 years. Um, they have, it, accordingly, they have limited range. They have tiny little antennas on them because you want to be able to throw it in your pocket. And not have to say, and not have to use, is that a radio in your pocket or are you just happy to see me as a line too often? But, no. They have an exceedingly limited battery life. Even the best of radios, I still have to carry a spare battery and swap it out in the middle of the day. And that's with turning on all the power saving features that I possibly can. But I can have it with me. And a radio that is with you is much better than a radio that is not, because then you have a chance to use it. Okay, charging right along. Solution, let's stick a huge antenna with a whole lot of transmitter behind it up on a building somewhere, and listen to the little tiny radios running around, and retransmit them at 200 foot above the ground on an antenna that's four to ten times the antenna that you have on your little radio at eh, eh, four, ten, hundred times this power. You know, depends on what you can afford. Thus, everybody is now able to hear you and you can work with a little HT and you have the coverage area of easily counties. Um, here's what it does. This is really basic. A repeater, a user transmits on frequency A. Users would be anybody out in the field who are trying to use this magical device called a repeater. The repeater sits there and listens to frequency A. When it hears a signal, it turns on its transmitter and repeats whatever it heard on frequency A back out on frequency B. All the users listen on frequency B. Here's where it gets complicated. There's a whole bunch of standard methods and frequency offsets and everything that you can remember which make it possible so you don't have to go through and say, okay, you're on frequency 146.49 and I need to receive there and I need to transmit over here. There's been a standardized set of rules where you can actually just specify one frequency and from that you can determine the transmit frequency, etc. So it's all automated, which means you don't have to remember it. Okay. Um, there's a slide in there that's missing. It went away. Oh well. Such is life. Okay, basic parts. The, need two radios. One of them's going to end up transmitting, one of them's going to end up receiving. You need a duplexer. This is a really neat chunk of RF hardware. This is probably the coolest part of an entire repeater. I'll get into its details in a moment. You need an antenna. And um, the antenna that's this long isn't going to do it. I've seen it done, but it's not a very good idea. And one times n feet of feed line. Feed line would be what most people call coax. Though, if you get serious about building repeaters, you don't want to be using what you find running your cable television. Okay, at least let me phrase that more carefully because I'm about to tell you later about using it, cable television hardware. But, uh, you don't want to be using the stuff that you run cable television in your house with. Okay, I'm going to start and do it from the top down, quite literally. The antenna. 
this is where all of the transmission and all of the receiving is coming from. It is typically a very, very high gain antenna, which means that it... Wow. I just realized how much jargon I'm just assuming everybody knows. I do apologize. Slow me down at any time you need me to explain it. High gain antenna. Omnidirectional, vertically polarized antennas usually don't get over about 10 or 12 dB of gain simply because they get unwieldy. A 10 to 15 dB gain antenna is typically 20 foot long. Now, imagine if you will wrenching this 20 foot long antenna that's eh, four or five inches across maybe, 200 foot in the air and sticking it on top of a tower that's, well, I'm wider than the tower. They're just unwieldy to deal with at a certain point. Um, and yes, yes, we are putting these on as high of a tower as you can possibly find. Typical hams can't go over about 200 foot due to FAA regulations. Yes, hams do have to abide by FAA regulations as well as FCC regulations and a number of other three-letter agencies. That said, sometimes you can get really lucky and convince somebody to let you have space on their commercial tower. One of the repeaters I end up working on every now and then is located 600 foot in the air off of a television transmitter tower. It is a very, very high profile repeater. High profile meaning you can interact with it from a very large distance away. Okay, so difference one between a repeater and your average radio, the antenna is eh, at least two or three orders of magnitude different in size. Feed line coax. Everybody has plugged in a cable television, right? That's coax. Coax is great stuff. It's flexible. It's lightweight. You can put ends on it using simply a pair of pliers. It isn't enough because it loses a whole lot of signal. And remember the game here. We're trying to make it better than using your little radios direct. So every single decibel of signal that we can hang on to, we need to. So there's this wonderful invention, it's called Hardline. It's called Hardline because I usually like describing it this way. If you will, imagine a very thin copper pipe, thin walled copper pipe, about an inch and a half around, with another very thin walled copper pipe running down the center of it. Now try and bend it in a circle. This is what's called bend radius. Bend radius on the Hardline I use, well, tight as possible the roll is this big around. Um, it's heavy. Like, um, you actually have to count pounds per foot and make sure that you don't unbalance the tower and have it fall over on you. This would be bad. It's no fun. Um, it's bulky. Like I said, it bends this big around. That's it. It doesn't go any tighter. Uh, it's expensive. You're looking at 4 to $6 per foot if you buy it new. And remember, your, repeat, your antenna is 200 foot in the air, and unless you feel like hauling all of the other crap up there, your radios are sitting on the ground. So this is 200 foot of feed line. The only reason we use it, it has a much, much lower loss per foot than any other thing out there. And you can get hard line. Hard line starts at about a half inch and works its way up through about three inches. So that's three inches across. That stuff is unwieldy to deal with. Much lower loss. This is the only reason you use it. You, we hate it all, and we have to use it all the time. Added fun. Add, yes. Hardline connectors, as in the thing you put on the end of the wire to turn it into something that looks like an RF connector, say N, BNC, TNC, any of these other various connectors that you might be familiar with, those are often running on the order of $200 for one connector to put on the end. Um, thankfully, hams are resourceful and we can look at anything and say, yes, that meets regulations. There are all sorts of neat ways to generate your own connectors and more importantly, use the cheap hard line that you can wander over to your cable TV company and say, hey, can I have some of your short ends of hard line? And cable TV companies, their definition of short end is anything, over a qu uh, anything under a quarter mile. That's a short end. Okay, <laughs> I'll get a trailer. 
I'll take them. I'll take them all. Uh, I literally did this. $15 for a half.